the New Day Demon, an Atlas of Depression, which won the 2001 National Book Award for Nonfiction, was a finalist for the 2002 Pulitzer Prize, and was included in the Times of London's list of the 100 best books of the decade. The New York Times described the New Day Demon as all-encompassing, brave, deeply humane, critically informed, and poetic, all at the same time. And those same words can be said as well for Andrew's most recent book, Far From the Tree, Parents, Children, and the Search for Identity, which has won the National Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction, the J. Anthony Lucas Award, the Annisfield Wolf Award, Yale University's Research Adv Advocacy Award, and at least 10 other awards that I honestly don't have time to list at the moment. And that's just so far. It's only been out a year. Far From the Tree was chosen as one of the New York Times 10 Best Books of 2012, a Publishers Weekly Best Book of 2012, a Kirkus Best Nonfiction Book of the same year, and a New York Times Book Review Notable Book of 2012, again, among many other distinctions still mounting. There are, these are not the only books that Andrew has published. To give you an idea of his astonishing range, he's the author of The Irony Tower, Soviet Artists in a Time of Glasnost, as well as a very beautiful novel, A Stone Boat, which was a national bestseller and runner-up for the Los Angeles Times First Fiction Prize, and which has been published in five languages. Andrew is a regular contributor to the New York Times, The New Yorker, Many of you may have read this past week's New Yorker's profile by Andrew of, of Paul Lanza, father of Adam Lanza, who uh, was the Newtown uh, killer, and it's an extraordinary piece of work if you haven't read it. He regularly contributes also to um, Travel and Leisure, the London Times. The list is very long there as well. Andrew Solomon is a lecturer on a wide range of topics. He's an activist in LGBTQ rights, mental health issues, the arts, and education. He's founder of the Solomon Research Fellowship in LGBTQ Studies at Yale University. He is a lecturer in psychiatry at the Weill Cornell Medical College in New York. And he serves on the boards of many major cultural institutions, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the World Monuments Fund, and Yado, as well as many others. Andrew received his PhD in psychology at Jesus College, Cambridge, where he also earned his master's degree in English literature. His BA is in English from Yale University. I could add many more accolades to the list, but here is what I think is actually maybe even more important than all of those things, and perhaps one of the reasons that make those other things possible. And that is that in addition to his many obvious talents, Andrew Solomon has something else. He has a kind of X factor, which I would describe as a nearly magical ability to connect to people, and through that connection, to unlock new truths about those people and about the greater world. He's got a genius for empathy and connecting. And I have to add that I personally have benefited from that extraordinary ability because I am very fortunate to call Andrew one of my good friends. And that is why it makes me especially happy to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Solomon to Lincoln and Sheldon Museum. Well, 
uh, these people sound so articulate in your description, they can't really have been like that. You must have made some of it up. <laughs> and I went back and re-interviewed some of the people from the book on camera so that you could see that actually people are that articulate and their stories are that moving. And I hope that this is now going to work. I will admit that the only place where it has completely not worked and where no one could make it work was at Google headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> when I was born down, my mother cried. She really did not see a future. The doctor said he would never amount to anything, his mental capacity would be little to none, and you should probably give him up and think about adoption. I really didn't even know that something was going on that there was something wrong in my mind. I didn't know the word transsexual, the word transgender hadn't even been invented yet. He has a mentor that helps him. No biting, Chris. Right. Chris probably had one of the worst diagnoses ever. Self-injurious, uh, swollen intestines, poisons in his system, mental retardation, severe autism. And I was pretty much told to, to put him in an institution. When I was born, my mom refused to see me for three days. She was scared. Before I transitioned, I, I just wasn't all there. I couldn't quite uh, share my feelings. I couldn't quite um, be a, a full member of the family. You sort of get what you get, and you go from there. And, you know, it's your choice. You want to make the best of it? You make the best of it. You want to make the worst of it? Throw yourself a pity party. I set out to write a book which was about how people found meaning in difficulty. It's hard for the kids to accept themselves. It's hard for their families to accept them. It's hard for the larger society to accept the kids and their parents. All of it is a struggle. I wouldn't ever want to pretend that these aren't difficult lives. They are very difficult lives. They're full of pain and complexity. We have joints and bones that are twisted and distorted. So our life is marred with a lot of surgeries. Myself, I've had 30. And there was one guy that I had a crush on. He said to me, why do you lip? And my heart would crush. Chris did not communicate. He didn't sit down. He didn't put on clothes. He wouldn't go outside. He ate the walls. He ate the table. He ate the rug. I could feel the back of my neck, you know, um, popping and sizzling. Like my head was just heating up. We couldn't eat in the home. We couldn't have lights on. We couldn't have the TV on. If I coughed, he would run downstairs and punch me. I actually felt that I was a surgeon, and I felt I had to, to literally extricate the demon from inside of my body. When I started this book, I knew that I was going to be looking at a lot of desperate situations. And I would do that by cutting and burning myself. What I didn't know was how much joy I was going to find. When I was born, my dad said, he looks cute. He's just got a big head and little arms. The funny thing is, I still look that way. And the relief that came over my face when I, when I heard that there was a name to what was going on with me. I used what God gave me. God get, didn't give me, you know, legs to run. He didn't give me arms to play football with. He gave me a brain, and he gave me a heart. And I try to use both of those things to the fullest. The thing I've learned most over the years is to be a parent first. I thought to myself, if he's happy, if he stops hurting himself, you know, if I could hug him, that that would be the greatest gift in life. It's kind of pretty sure that I'm going to have obstacles, but I would have had them anyway. I know my dad was very, very proud of me because I went on a journey that he never dreamed possible. I don't think of myself as a schizophrenic. I am Susan. There really isn't any definition of what's normal or not normal or far from the tree or right under the tree. I'm lucky to have had her in this particular period of I'm time. I'm lucky too. In... Thank you. The love that parents have for their children. I guess we are pretty lucky, huh? Yes, Mom. Yeah can see them through an enormous amount.
even in purely non-religious terms, homosexuality represents a misuse of the sexual faculty. It is a pathetic little second-rate substitute for reality, a pitiable flight from life. As such, it deserves no glamorization, no rationalization, and above all, no pretense that it is anything but a pernicious sickness. That's Time Magazine in 1966, when I was three years old. And in the last 12 months, the President of the United States and the Supreme Court have expressed support for gay marriage. And I set out to write my book, Interested in Discovering How We Got From There to Here. How did something that was universally acknowledged to be an illness come instead to be understood as an identity? And what did it mean for a shift like that to take place and what other similar shifts might be going to take place. When I was perhaps six years old, I went with my mother and my brother to a shoe store in Manhattan called Indian Walk, which I think is a name that wouldn't go down so well today. <laughs> and um, it was fine then. And we went off to Indian Walk and we got our shoes fitted. And at the end, the salesman told my brother and me that each of us could have a balloon. And my brother wanted a red balloon, and I wanted a pink balloon. And my mother said that she thought I'd really rather have a blue balloon. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I really wanted the pink balloon. And she reminded me that my favorite color was blue. <laughs> the fact that my favorite color now is blue, but I'm still gay, <laughs> gives you some evidence of my mother's influence and its limits. <laughs> When I was growing up, she used to say often, the love you have for your children is like no other feeling in the world. And until you have children, you don't know what it feels like. And when she said that, and I was a small child, I took it as the greatest possible compliment. It meant that bringing up my brother and me had been one of the greatest satisfactions of her life. And then when I was an adolescent and she said it, I thought to myself, but I might be gay. And it made me anxious that she said it. And after I came out in my early 20s, it made me furious when she said it. I said, you know that's not the path I'm on, you know that's not where I'm going, and I want you to stop saying that. But she never did stop saying it. About 20 years ago, my editors at the New York Times Magazine asked me to write a piece about deaf culture. And I was very taken aback by the assignment. I had mostly been doing international reporting. My editor said, this is a foreign culture within our own. And I had always thought of deafness as nothing but a misfortune. Those poor people, they couldn't hear. What could we do for them? And then I went into the deaf world. And I went to one thing after the next. I went to deaf clubs. I went to deaf theater. I went to the meeting of the National Association of the Deaf. I even went to the Miss Deaf America contest in Nashville, Tennessee where everyone complained about that slurry southern signing. <laughs> <laughs> and as I got deeper and deeper in the deaf world, I came to understand that deafness was a culture, that it was a culture and a community. I understood that deaf people had intimacies organized around their shared use of sign language. And standing at the National Association of the Deaf meeting, I found myself, for a moment, wishing I were deaf. Not wishing that I couldn't hear, because I use my hearing and like it and enjoy music and speech, but wishing that I were part of this intense, engaged, intimate world of all of these people speaking to each other with such animation with their hands. And then I discovered that most deaf children are born to hearing parents, that those hearing parents, by and large, have tried, at least historically, to get those children to fit in with what they think of as the real world and that many of those deaf people discover deaf culture in adolescence or thereafter when it comes as a glorious revelation to them. And as I listened to that narrative, it seemed very familiar to me. And I thought how similar it was to the experience of gay people who were born to straight parents, whose parents often try to pressure them in one way or another into conforming to what they see as the normal world, and who ultimately have to find identity with a peer group and then a friend of a friend of mine had a daughter who was a dwarf. And she began talking about all of these related questions. Should she bring her daughter up 
to think she was just like everyone else, but a little bit short? Or should she somehow instill in her the idea that she had a dwarf identity? Should she get involved with the little people of America? Should she go off and get deeply attached um, to other dwarfs in order to have a sound self-image? And as this mother narrated her bewilderment, I thought, here it is again. Here it is again. A family that perceives itself to be normal with a child whom they perceive to be in some way different, trying to figure out what to do and whether they can help that child achieve an identity. And I came to think that there are essentially two kinds of identity. There are vertical identities that are passed down generationally. So once race or ethnicity is a vertical identity, um, frequently one's uh, nationality, um, often one's religion, these are all things that parents and children frequently have in common. Now, there are many instances in which people who have those identities experience difficulty because of them but there is nobody attempting to cure them. It's easier in this country, the current presidency notwithstanding, to be, uh, to be Caucasian than it is to be uh, a person of color. But there's nobody doing research on how to ensure that the next generation born to parents of color come out with blonde hair and blue eyes. What we need to change is the prejudice of the society. And then there are horizontal identities, which I call horizontal because they're learned from a peer group. Identities that a child and parent do not have in common, but that are very explicit and very pronounced in the child. So I looked at, while I was writing, my own experience as a gay person, and I looked at deafness, dwarfism, Down syndrome, autism, schizophrenia, multiple severe disabilities, and then I looked at some more socially constructed situations. How do parents deal with having a child who's a prodigy? They're also probably not prodigies themselves. It can throw up quite a significant challenge. Or how do parents respond to having children who were conceived in rape? How does where a child comes from present an impediment to parental love? And how do they respond to a child who commits crimes, which was what led me to the Peter Lanza story that Wanda alluded to earlier. Um, and then a final chapter on people who are transgender. And as I looked at all of those conditions, all of those, as I call them, horizontal identities, I was very struck by a division which I had not seen myself in my own life as I was growing up or had not understood. And that's the division between love and acceptance. It's possible that love occurs even before a child is born. It's ideally there from the day the child first walks out, um, uh, when it's first carried out of the hospital. Um, it's something that should be permanent and it should in many ways be unconditional. But acceptance is different. Acceptance takes a lot of work and a lot of doing. And acceptance is something people arrive at only eventually. And while I think that it would be uh, wonderful to feel acceptance was always the goal of love, I think conflating them is dangerous. And when I understood that, I realized that what I had experienced as deficits in my parents' love, when they weren't so thrilled about finding out that I was gay initially, were not deficits in love. My parents always loved me. There were deficits in acceptance. Now, for acceptance really to take hold, it has to operate at three levels. There's self-acceptance, there's family acceptance, and there's acceptance by the larger world. And each of those feeds the others. So a person with really good self-acceptance can help his family to come around better than someone who's full of self-doubt. But if that family is living in an accepting world, that will make things a lot easier for them. The family in effect, is what mediates, especially for these conditions they don't share with their children, between their children and the world. And most of the parents I met, as they struggled toward acceptance, which most of them ultimately achieved, went through um, phases. They started off outraged by the way in which their child differed from them. They became bewildered as they continued to spend time trying to understand, and many of them ultimately emerged as celebratory. I'm going to tell you the stories of some of the people who are in the book. And I'll start with Clinton Brown, who's the dwarf you saw in the video. Clinton Brown, as he said, when he was born, his parents were told actually to leave him to die in the hospital. Um, and uh, his mother said, no, that's my baby, and I'm going to take my baby home, and I'm going to try. And even though she was a person without vast educational or economic resources, she found her way to the best doctor for dealing with his condition diastrophic dwarfism, 
a man named Stanley Kopitz at Johns Hopkins, and she brought him to Dr. Kopitz, and Dr. Kopitz um, said, um, this is going to be a beautiful child. And in the course of his childhood, he had, as he mentioned, 30 major surgical procedures, many of them spinal or cranial procedures, which meant that he was immobilized, sometimes for periods of months at a time. And while he was stuck in the hospital going through all of those procedures, which have allowed him now to walk, at least for limited distances, he decided there was nothing else much to do, and so he might as well do his schoolwork. And he worked on his schoolwork, and he achieved academically at a level that had previously been unimaginable in his family. And eventually, he became the first member of his family to go to college. And he went to college not far from where his parents lived, and he had a specially fitted car that he was able to drive with his unusual body. And his mother called me one day and she said, I was coming home from shopping and I went past a bar and there was Clinton's car parked outside the bar. He said, and I thought to myself, he's three feet tall, they're six feet tall, two beers for them is four beers for him. I wanted to go right in there. I knew I could. So I went home and I left him 11 messages on his voicemail. <laughs> I said, and then I thought, if someone had told me when he was born that my future worry would be that he would go drinking and driving with his college buddies, I have been so thrilled to have that problem. And I said to her, what do you think you did that allowed this to happen? How did this child, for whom there was such a terrible prognosis at the beginning, manage to emerge as someone who's poised? and articulate, and accomplished, and popular, and happy. And she said, what did we do? We loved him, that's all. Clinton just always had that light in him. And we were lucky enough to be the first to see it there. I've seen this attitude, this extraordinary attitude, time and again. And I've seen this ennobling face of disability time and again. I'll tell you just briefly about another person who had another form of dwarfism, Kiki Peck, who had kinesis dysplasia, um, and who, which is a condition that uh, affects your cartilage and uh, causes people uh, to have uh, problems in their hearing as well as problems in some of their facial structures um, and a form of dwarfism. And Kiki um, uh, was very close to her mother, and when she was nine, her mother called Kiki and her brother in and said, that she had been diagnosed with breast cancer and she was going to have to have chemotherapy, but that she was going to be fine. But in the meanwhile, she needed to shave her head because she was going to lose all her hair. And Kiki said, well, I'll help you shave your head. And her mother said, okay, thank you. That would be very nice. So Kiki helped her mother. And when they finished, Kiki said, and now I'm going to shave my head. And her mother said, what are you talking about? Why on earth would you do that? And she said, I've spent a lot of time in my life being different all by myself. And I know how lonely it is. And I'd like you to have someone else to be different the same way you are at the same time. So as a child of nine, um, it's such an extraordinary thing to have thought, to have said. It's not simply that she was able to be kind despite her dwarfism. It's that she was able to be kind in some particular ways because of it. I'm going to quote to you from one more magazine from the 1960s. This is the Atlantic Monthly, that voice of liberal America in 1968, saying, there is no reason to feel guilty about putting a Down syndrome child away, whether it is put away in the sense of hidden in a sanitarium or in a more responsible, lethal sense. It is sad, yes, dreadful, but it carries no guilt. True guilt arises only from an offense against a person and a Downs is not a person. People murmur when they hear that now. People are shocked by it. There's been an enormous amount of ink given to the changing status of gay people in this country, <coughs> the way in which a revolution has taken place. But there's been much less coverage of the fact that as a society altogether, we've shifted in our relationship to difference, and we've shifted in our relationship to what we think constitutes humanity. And that progress, which affects people with all kinds of differences and disabilities, deserves to have its story told. One of the families I met as I was working on my Down syndrome chapter were Tom and Karen Robards. When their son was born with DS, 
They were hard-charging Wall Street types, they were young, they had not expected anything of the kind, and they were completely overwhelmed and didn't know what to do. In a few years, it was time for their son to begin schooling, and they felt that the schooling options that were available to him were unsatisfactory. So they got together with two other couples they knew who had children with Down syndrome, and they set up a little classroom, and they got a teacher who could come and work with their children. That tiny experiment has since then grown into something called the Cook Center, which has now educated untold thousands of people with Down syndrome and other intellectual disabilities. Um, it's an extraordinary institution. Um, and in the time that the Cook Center has existed, and in the time since that article in the Atlantic Monthly, the life expectancy of people with Down syndrome has more than doubled. And people with Down syndrome are living very, very different lives. Um, they are actors, they are writers, they are uh, working, many of them are living at least semi-independently. Someone I know who had worked for many years with people with Down syndrome described going out to lunch with the actor with Down syndrome who appears on Glee. And she said, people were coming up and asking for his autograph. He was a celebrity first and a person with a disability second. I never thought I would live to see such a thing. So I said to the Robards, you were involved in this revolution and in this change in what the lives of people with Down syndrome are like. I said, it's been such a huge part of your life. Do you regret it? Do you wish you'd never heard of Down syndrome? Do you wish you'd never had a child who was affected by it? Would you like to make it go away? And Tom Robard said, well, for our son David, I would like to make it go away. Because for David, it's a difficult way to be in the world. And I would like to give David an easier life. He said, but I think if we lost all the people with Down syndrome from the world, it would be a real and catastrophic uh, loss. And so the personal wish and the social wish are in opposition. And then Karen Robart said, um, she said, you know, I'm with Tom. If I could make it go away for David, I would, because I would like to give David an easier life. But speaking for myself, though I would never have believed 25 years ago when he was born that I could come to such a point. Speaking for myself, this has given me so much richer and more purposeful and more meaningful and more interesting a life than I would ever have had without it. But speaking for myself, I wouldn't exchange these experiences for anything in the world. Now we live in a time of remarkable social progress. We live in a time when deafness is more widely acknowledged, when it's fairly standard when one gives a lecture to have a sign language interpreter. Standard and wonderful to have an interpreter. Um, we live in a time when dwarfism is more accepted and physical differences are tolerated. And we live, as I just described, in a time when the lives of people with Down syndrome are transformed. But while we live in this time of social progress, we also live in a time of medical progress. The cochlear implant, which is the device that gets surgically implanted in the brain and connected to a transmitter, allowing sound to bypass the structures of the ear and go directly into the brain, means that there are fewer and fewer people who are functionally deaf. Most, deaf, most children born deaf in this country are given cochlear implants. And so that signing culture that I saw and engaged with has been in many ways losing its uh, population numbers. A compound recently developed called BMN 111 for uh, uh, the treatment of achondroplasia actually blocks the action of the gene for that, the most common dwarfing condition. Mice with the achondroplasia gene who are given BMN 111 grow to full height. Testing in human beings is underway. And so far as Down syndrome goes, there are blood tests that allow people earlier and earlier in pregnancy and less and less invasively to find out whether they're carrying a child with Downs or another genetic anomaly, and that makes it easier and easier for people who wish to do so to terminate um, those pregnancies. Now, I am a believer in social progress, and I am a believer in medical progress. It's not that I think one of them is right and the other is wrong but I think they frequently don't seem to notice each other. And when I see the cultural efflorescence in the deaf community at the same time as the cochlear implant, when I see all of these changes that are taking place and how they butt up against one another, I sometimes feel it's like those moments in grand opera when the hero realizes he loves the heroine at the exact moment that she lies expiring on a sofa. <laughs> The question of what should be treated and what should be cured is one that haunts this whole conversation. Um, autism 
Ascension is an area in which there is a very vivid autism rights movement, um, which I have been brushing up against because uh, Adam Lanza had an autism diagnosis and I have written about him and there you are, the autism rights people are all over you. Uh, but it's the case that there are many people who have autism diagnosis who feel that their way of thinking is not such a terrible tragedy, it's a different way of thinking and should be accepted in the panoply of human intellect. Jim Sinclair, who's an outspoken autism activist, said, when parents say, I wish my child did not have autism, what they're really saying is, I wish the autistic child I have did not exist, and I had a different, non-autistic child instead. Read that again. This is what we hear when you mourn over our existence. This is what we know when you pray for a cure, that your fondest wish is that someday we will cease to be, and strangers you can love will move in behind our faces. It's a very strong statement, but it's a statement of a position that existed in almost all of the communities that I looked at. People said that the way they were, the condition they had, was what had made them themselves. It was very profoundly and fundamentally central to their identity. And parents who had children with autism were stuck in this constant question of all parenthood, but particularly of this parenthood, which is deciding what to change and what to accept or celebrate. Now, good parenting involves changing people. You have children, and you give them education, and you teach them to tie their shoes, and you try to instill moral values, and if you didn't do those things, you would be grossly neglectful. But parenthood also involves recognizing who your child is, and helping your child develop the ego strength to feel like an adequate human being by celebrating him or her for who he or she is. And that process is terribly um, obvious for many qualities that children have. There are all kinds of ways that you think, that's my kid and I have to buck him up. But there's a lot that falls in a confusing center. And autism particularly illuminates that confusing center because there are enough people who have benefited enough from some form of treatment for autism so that it seems like a terrible mistake not to do anything. But there are many treatments which are expensive and time consuming and very difficult and don't necessarily yield consistent results and people get lost in the morass of them. One of the mothers I spent a lot of time with and with her, and with her husband and with the whole family, but she uh, uh, was the mother of a child who has spoken four times. She had said nothing, the daughter, Cece. Cece had said nothing until she was um, about six years old. And then one night, the family were all sitting and watching television, and her mother stood up and switched the set off, and Cece said, I want the television on. And the family was completely astonished. Thought their whole world was changing. She said nothing more for four years. And four years later, she was at school, and there was a puppet show, and someone said, and what color is the king's robe? And Cece said, it's purple. So she spoke not only four times, and each time what she said was contextually correct. And what her parents said to me was, if you have a child who's never spoken, you can get away with thinking that that child doesn't understand language, doesn't know what language is, isn't actually in the world in the way that the rest of us are in the world. But to have a child who's spoken four times leaves you thinking for the whole rest of your life, why those four times? How did she break through on those occasions? What was special then? What else does she have to say? What is the traffic jam that's going on? And her mother said to me, Cece is the Zen lesson. Why does Cece have autism? Because Cece has autism. And what is it like being Cece? Being Cece. Because no one else is and will never know what it's like. It is what it is. It isn't anything else, and maybe you'll never change it, and maybe you should stop trying. That theme came up again and again, that theme of people being liberated at the point at which they decided to stop trying to change what was true, evidently true, about their own child. Susan Weinreich was the woman with schizophrenia who was in the video um, and spent many years in a state of acute psychosis. She went through decades when she didn't shower, um, and she was uh, constantly hallucinating. She had a completely terrifying life. And she described to me how when she finally was brought into effective treatment, um, how her doctor told her that she was going to be able to make a recovery. And she described that gradual process. And she said, I remember the first time I 
felt love after all of that. I don't remember it being very dramatic. It was like when I was a little girl and I would go fishing and catch a sunfish. Just that tug on the other end of the line. I don't even remember who it was for, probably my therapist. But as my psychosis receded, it left room for my heart to grow. And Susan has gone on to be an outspoken advocate for people with schizophrenia and other mental illnesses. Um, and she's appeared um, in, a, uh, in various contexts talking about that. And her mother described going to a mental health benefit dinner at which Susan stood up and spoke. And her mother, who had been so horrified but unclear what to do during those many years when her daughter was completely psychotic and completely dysfunctional, her mother said, there we were at this dinner. And there, standing up in front of everyone, was Susan. I mean, this is Susan. How did this happen? And she said, she's definitely a stronger person than I've ever been. What saved her? It was her therapist. It was medication. It was the support from her brothers and me. But most of all, it was Susan. There was always something in Susan that wanted to come to the surface. I feel really bad that she had to go through what she went through, but I also recognize that if she hadn't, she wouldn't be who she is today. And who she is today is the most wonderful, beautiful woman. I was very struck by these arguments that began to seem um, to repeat and to echo one another. And I felt that in looking at families of people who committed crimes, I was looking at the guilt those families felt, at the complexity of their experience and at the sense that their children had somehow betrayed them, as well as the problem that a larger society blamed them. And among the many parents I met, the one who had the most powerful effect on me was the family of Dylan Klebold, who was one of the perpetrators of the Columbine Massacre. It took years for me to persuade his parents to talk to me. And once I persuaded them, they were so full of their story that they couldn't stop telling it. The first weekend we spent together, we recorded 20 full hours of interviews. And when we got to the end of those 20 hours and were sitting on Sunday night, exhausted in the kitchen while Sue fixed dinner, I said, but if Dylan were here now, is there anything you'd want to ask him? And his father, Tom Klebold, said, there sure is. I'd want to ask him what the hell he thought he was doing. And Sue Klebold looked at the floor, and she thought for a minute. And then she said, I would ask him to forgive me for being his mother and never knowing what was going on inside his head. And when she and I had dinner some years later in Denver one night, um, and she said, you know, when it first happened, I used to wish I had never met Tom, that I had never married. If I hadn't gone to Ohio State, we wouldn't have found each other, and these children wouldn't have existed, and this terrible thing wouldn't have happened. But over time, I've come to feel that I love the children I have so much that I don't want to imagine a life without them, even at the price of this pain. When I say that, I'm talking about my own pain, of course, and not the pain of other people. But life is full of suffering, and this is mine. So while I recognize that it would have been better for the world if Dylan had never been born, I've decided that it would not have been better for me. It seems implausible on the face of it. How could Susan Weinreich's mother actually say she's become a wonderful person through all of this and express a kind of gratitude to it? How could the Robards say uh, that they were so glad of having had this experience? How could Clinton's mother say, or Kiki Peck's mother say, that they had such an extraordinary experience of these children and would never want to give them up for anything? And how, how could Sue Klebold look at the son she had produced and look at the way in which his act destroyed her entire life and have anything other than despair in the face of it. And I thought, of course all of these people would have preferred to have other, healthier children. Of course they would have. And then, as I got to understand uh, that more and more, I realized that all of us who have children have children who are flawed in some way. And all of us love them despite their flaws. And none of us want to exchange them for other, better children. If some glorious angel dropped through your living room ceiling and offered to take your children away and give you children who are more attractive and more intelligent and more polite 
Um, <laughs> you would most likely pray away that atrocious spectacle. And I thought that in looking at how these families had dealt with children who were so different and who posed such enormous obstacles, that we were looking at a more extreme version of the common experience. But in the same way that we test flame retardant pajamas in an inferno to make sure they won't catch fire when our child reaches across the stove, so the stories of these families illuminated the stories of all families. And that narrative of gratitude for the children one has is one that persists everywhere. One of the mothers who I talked to, who had two children with very severe disabilities, neither of whom could walk or talk, one of those children died through caregiver neglect. And the mother said at the internment of her child's ashes, let me bury here the rage I feel to have been twice robbed. Once of the child I wanted, and once of the son I loved. Another mother, who also had two children with severe disabilities, said, people always give us these little sayings, like, God doesn't give you any more than you can handle. But children like ours are not preordained as a gift. They're a gift, because that's what we have chosen. And so, I found that I was writing a book that turned out, surprisingly, to be about people who had ended up grateful for lives they would have done almost anything to avoid. And I came to think that there was a great deal in common in the experiences that these various people had with these various kinds of differences. That you think that your difference isolates you. You only have things in common with other people with schizophrenia. You only have things in common with other people with dwarfism. You only have things in common with other prodigies. But actually, the experience of difference within families is a near universal. All parenting and all taking care of children involves recognizing the separateness and the individuation of your child and bridging that gap. And if we say that the experiences of these many families I was talking to are indicative of some kind of shared experience of difference within families, then we recognize that instead of these people living in siloed isolation with just their identity group, that actually their difference is what unites them all. And when I finished writing this book, I had a publication party. And I tried to invite as many of the people in the book as I could. And three weeks after the book came out, I got a call one day. Uh, sorry, I received a message one day uh, with a picture. And the picture was of a person with schizophrenia, a woman with dwarfism, um, and, and the mother of an autistic child who had all gone out to dinner because they'd all met there and realized how much they had in common. Mm -hmm. And the people in the book, many of them were initially, I mean, everyone, in fact, initially was offended by the other chapters. <laughs> <laughs> the autistic people said, but we're so much smarter than those people with Down syndrome. The criminal said, OK, we may be a little bit weird, but we're not like those transgender people. That's the reason. Um, the prodigies couldn't understand what they were doing in there at all. <laughs> discovered that it actually made sense and that their differences did in some sense unite them. Um, and I, while I was writing this book, um, had decided to have children. And many people said to me, how can you possibly have decided to have children in the midst of a book about everything that can go wrong? And I said, you know, it's not really a book about everything that can go wrong. It's a book about how much love and joy there can be even when everything is going wrong. And rather than discouraging me from parenthood, it motivated me toward it. So I will explain my family in the most condensed way I can. My husband is the biological father of two children with some lesbian friends in Minneapolis. One of my closest friends from college had gone through a divorce but wanted to have a child, and we decided to do that. And so I have a daughter who lives with her mother in Texas. And then my husband and I decided we wanted to have a child to be with us full time. So we have a child of whom I am the biological father, we had an egg donor, and our surrogate was Laura, the lesbian mother of his two biological children. <laughs> <laughs> so the shorthand is five parents of four children in three states. <laughs> and there seem to be people out there who feel that the existence of a family such as mine somehow undermines the integrity of families such as theirs. And I don't accept those attractive models of love. Only out of And I think in the same way that we need species diversity to keep the planet going, so we need this diversity of affection to sustain the ecosphere of kindness. The day 
after our son was born, we were in the hospital, feeling jubilant, and the pediatrician came in. And she said, your son is not extending his legs correctly. And I said, oh. And she said, that could be an indication of neurological damage. And I said, what? And she said, and insofar as he is extending them, he's doing so asymmetrically, which could indicate a mass in his brain. She said, and by the way, he has a very large head, and we really should test him for hydrocephalus. And I felt the whole center of my being pour out of me onto the floor of that hospital room. And I thought how ironic it was that I had spent all this time writing a book about how parents managed to find so much meaning in the experience of children with differences and disabilities, and how much I did not want to join their number. <laughs> and as I felt that um, a deep sadness um, overcome me, I knew that I was experiencing his condition as illness. But I knew in the back of my mind that if he really had the conditions we were looking at, they would become his identity. And if they became his identity, they would become my identity too, inevitably. And I thought to myself, the love for your children is unlike any other feeling in the world. And until you have children, you don't know what it feels like. We went through MRIs, CAT scans, other kinds of x-rays, an arterial blood draw. We took this day-old child, not old enough to find any comfort in our presence, and stuck him in one machine after the next. And for five hours, we wondered what was going to happen. And at the end of that time, the pediatrician called us into her office and said that the scans were all completely clear and that George now was extending his legs correctly. <laughs> and I asked her what she thought had been going on in the morning, and she said he had probably had a crank. <laughs> I think children had ensnared me the minute I connected fatherhood with loss. But I doubt I would have noticed that if I hadn't been enmeshed in this research. I had encountered with all of these families over and over again so much strange love, and that made it easy to fall into its bewitching patterns. I had often thought the parents who I was interviewing were actually fools, enslaving themselves to a lifetime journey with their miserable children and trying to breathe identity out of misfortune. And that day in the hospital, I realized that my research had built me a plank and that I was ready to join them on their ship. Thank you.
and inspired by it to act and courage of their own. And if you have a child who has a disability or a difference, you have to be a fighter. And most of these parents have fought hard for their children. Some more successfully, some less successfully. Some have fought too hard and it can become exhausting for the child. But the basic motif of having to be courageous and go out into the world was an extraordinarily important one. The point of thinking, I don't care if everyone stares when I walk down the street with my child who looks so different. I'm just going to walk down the street anyway. It takes huge courage to conceptualize that, and it takes courage to live it every single day. Yes? In the book, you mentioned that you did a lot of interviews that didn't make it into the book and with a lot of identity groups. Do you have material that you think will be published at some later date, another book, or magazine articles? Most of the chapters that I didn't write, I did sort of piecemeal research for, and I don't at the moment have plans to publish anything. The chapters that were the last to go were a chapter on families of people who commit suicide, a chapter on families of people with um, terminal illnesses. I was quite focused on cystic fibrosis, um, and a chapter uh, on people who set out uh, deliberately to adopt disabled children, which was in my little upbeat note um, in there. And uh, I got really interesting material in all three areas, and I don't know at what point I might go on with, um, with them or write something else. But for the moment, the book um, ended up being quite chunky as it was, and I just I couldn't put um, everyone and everything in. Yes? Uh, one thing you didn't touch on was the parents of the gifted child, because you had a chapter on that. Is there anything that stands out that you'd like to share with us uh, that fits into your theme for tonight? So the chapter on prodigies worked on the proposition that while it is less sad for your child to have um, a positive difference than one that is generally construed negatively, it is actually no less stressful or difficult. Once again, you have the experience where the child requires a different kind of treatment from his peers. You have to become an expert in an area that you may not have known anything about. And you have the situation, it's quite awkward to have the mind of a five-year-old in the body of a 30-year-old. But it's also quite awkward to have the mind of a 30-year-old in the body of a 5-year-old. In both cases, you have the problem of what's called asynchrony, in which your child's intellect and emotional development and physical age don't align correctly. So you have this child who's a prodigy, and you think, OK, does, um, uh, do I put him with uh, other people who will be interested in what he's interested in? No, they don't really want to make friends with a 5-year-old. Do I put him with other 5-year-olds? No. The five-year-olds aren't going to understand a single thing he says, and so they face these extreme difficulties. They have to figure out how to get their child through an education system without their child being um, so bored that he sort of basically drops out. So that's also um, like dealing with the educational needs of children with disabilities. I had a lot of interesting conversations while I was working on that chapter, and the one that I come back to is perhaps telling was that I um, was interviewing a young man named Mark Yu, who at the time I saw him was seven, but looked about five, and who uh, was uh, taking uh, piano lessons um, for most of the day, practicing up to seven um, hours a day, was also doing an SAT prep course at the time that I met him, um, was doing all of these sort of extraordinary things, and was keeping up a rigorous performance schedule all over the country. And I sat down with Mark and his mother, and I said, but don't you ever worry about giving Mark a normal childhood? And Mark said, I already have a normal childhood. Do you want to go upstairs and see my room? It's kind of messy, but you can come anyway. So I said, OK. So he went up to his room, and he showed me his favorite cartoons. And I noticed next to the television a stack of Sesame Street videos. And we went, he got through the cartoons, and then he said, OK, let's go downstairs now, and I'll play you the show kind of fantasy and prompt <laughs> We went downstairs and he played the Chopin with a kind of adult nuance and yearning that seemed unimaginable in someone who still liked Pokey Monster. And when he finished, his mother turned to me and said, you see, he's not a normal child. Why should he have a normal childhood? That wouldn't be my philosophy, but that had some validity to it, and I think it worked well for them. Yes? You're a marvelous storyteller. And Thank you. Really. You, you really make clear the tension between medicine that can cure and acceptance that can build up. Uh, but I, we also have a rich uh, and emerging science of human nature, uh, informed by evolutionary theory and genetics and neuroscience. I wonder how much that emerging science informs your views and whether you found that there was awareness of it in the advocacy groups you, you encountered. Well, I 
think science informs um, everyone's experience of their conditions. You know, you can't have any of these conditions or have a child with any of these conditions and not be constantly struck by the way that science is changing. And also by the possibility that these populations will, because of scientific advances, effectively disappear as we get to be better at seeing or curing the conditions that I was looking at. I think people are thinking about that all the time. Um, there's a lot of genetics work being done. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, my most recent piece of writing was this profile of Adam Lance's father, and Adam Lance's DNA is being sequenced. And I said, but what would there be in his DNA that would explain this? And they said, we don't know, and we don't expect to find out much, but it might be the beginning of something where someday after we've had enough of these people and sequenced enough of their DNA, we can pick up some kind of pattern. So there's a sense that the, the patterning is central and crucial. People don't like to be treated as um, broken, and they don't like to be treated in any sense as what some of them refer to as a science experiment. But all of them want to have insight into what their condition is, and what it looks like, and where it comes from. The question is how you can ensure that the scientific, excuse me, that the scientific progress is never inconvenient, and that's the struggle that they all negotiate. Yes, in fact. You talk a lot about the relationship of parents and children. Have you considered or explored the relationship one generation back, that's the grandparents? Does this cause more stress for the parents or the child, or is it at this point irrelevant? Um, I looked a little bit at grandparents in cases in which people talked about them. My sense by and large was that for many of the conditions that are clearly defined as disease conditions, grandparents were very supportive, where they were able to help financially, they did, where they could take on some of the burden of dealing with very difficult children, they did. But sometimes the grandparents had grown up in the time of that Atlantic Monthly article, and they felt like these children should just be put away. And sometimes the parents had to negotiate their own decision to keep their child with grandparents of the child, with their own parents who, um, who resisted it. I also found that in the things that are, as I put it, more socially constructed, that there could be very different generational attitudes. So many of the people I met who had children who were transgender and who had decided to be supportive of those children through the difficult process of transition had themselves parents, their children's grandparents, who were less open to the idea that this was a natural part of human variety. And so there was sometimes tension around that. Yes? talk in some cases about the mother's reactions and in some cases about the father's, and I wonder whether you can make any generalizations as to the mothers and the fathers about their attitudes. Um. As I work on my new book, which is about uh, uh, the ways in which motherhood and fatherhood are merging in some measure into an idea of parenthood, I feel like I should say, no, we live in post-feminist times and it's all exactly the same. <laughs> but actually, <laughs> actually, what I found over time was that um, it was frequently the mothers who did the emotional work and it was the fathers who did the pragmatic work. So I think, for example, of one family of a child with very, very severe um, disabilities, um, she lives at home, I feel like her mother is the one who's figured out what the things are that pain her and what the things are that seem to make her happy, she has no language, what the ways are of dealing with this child um, that are better um, at that level, that she loves to be strapped into a swing and so on. But her father is the one who figured out um, how to get the support from the educational system they needed to ensure that she was given as much education as she could receive, who figured out how to ensure that they got um, an insurance payment from the hospital um, where her uh, condition was ultimately assessed to be the fault of uh, the doctor who delivered her, um, who deprived her of oxygen in the first minutes of uh, her life. Um, he was the one who had dealt with the sort of legal aspect of it. There was often that division of labor, the kind of outside inside. But in that household, the two parents talked to each other all the time, and the father was very attached to his daughter and very engaged with her. It was just that the mothers did more of that emotional figuring out work. And interestingly, when I uh, asked Peter Lanza the same question that I had asked the Klebolds, and uh, or Sue Klebold, and I said, do you, um, do you feel that you really love Adam, or do you wish he'd never been born? And Peter Lanza said, and it was difficult for him, but he said, I wish he had never been born. He said, it's not natural to say that when you're talking about your kid, but given what happened, I don't see how I could feel any other way. And people afterwards said to me, it's so striking how different his response was from Sue Klebold's. And I said, there were two essential differences. 
One is that I first sat down with the Klebolds five years after Columbine had taken place. The other is that I was talking to a mother versus a father. And for a mother, I think that she felt that the love outweighed the horror. And for the father, I think he feels a lot of love, but I think the horror outweighs the love. And I thought there was some gender basis for that, uh, that difference. Yes? Um, I heard the interview that Okay, one last question. Yes? Did you talk to 
siblings, and if so, what did you learn? Ah, uh, the siblings question. <laughs> um, I did talk to siblings. They weren't really my focus because I was interested in this intergenerational aspect. But I did talk to siblings inevitably as I did this work. And I think the position of siblings was best summed up by Tegan de who was a brother with Down syndrome, and who said, um, she said, you know, on any given night when I was growing up, I was incredibly angry about Adam. I was angry we had to stay home because of Adam. I was angry that my mother couldn't pay any attention to me because she was paying attention to Anna. She said, on a day-by-day -day basis, there were times when it made me furious. Overall, he's my brother, and I love him enormously, and I would never want to imagine a life without him. And he's influenced my values, what I do in the world, and my decision to try to help other people. She said, so I would never want to imagine him out of existence. And that was what I found. It's interesting that the wisdom until the mid to late 1970s was that if you had a child who had a significant difference, that child should be put away in a home someplace so that your child wouldn't have to, your healthy child, wouldn't have to experience the humiliation um, of having this sort of weird sibling, um, and so that you wouldn't have to be distracted from taking care of your healthy child. Then in the 1970s, people noticed that actually what happened was that the healthy children grew up thinking, gee, if something goes wrong with me, I'll get shunted off to one of those places too. And it was actually a horrible thing for them to grow up knowing that they had a full sibling who had been put away in that, uh, in that sense. And so um, the wisdom changed. Interestingly, the shift in the wisdom had entirely to do with what was best for the healthy sibling and very little to do with what was best for the affected sibling. Um, but I think the overall experience of siblings, as I found it, was um, not that it was easy. It was not easy. It is not easy having someone who's different in any of these ways in your house, including a prodigy. I mean, there was one person who I talked to with the sibling of an extraordinary piano prodigy, um, Drew Peterson, and um, I said to his brother, what was it like growing up with Drew as your brother? And he said, it would have been the same if I had a brother with a wooden leg. Um, <laughs> and I think there's really that sense that the negotiation of difference is difficult and stressful and exhausting, but ultimately also um, frequently rewarding. So I'm going to thank you all, and I will be signing books and look forward to seeing you there.